Greetings, fellow humans. Welcome to Sam and Max Hit the Books. I am Max Williams, and with me, as always, is Sam Richards. Hey. And we've got the new comic books uh, for the week that I purchased and we both read. Um, last week of February here? Yes, yes. It, well, the first week of February. Oh, last this, week of this, January. This was the end of January's books, yes. yes that is what I meant. Um, and uh, a pretty decent... I think this was a fifth week. And usually fifth weeks tend to be pretty weak, like in terms of releases. And, right. Uh, there was actually a lot of, a lot of good stuff in, uh, in the... In the uh, I'd say this is actually a pretty strong week. So uh, let's kick it right off with the Justice League Annual, written by Scott Snyder and James Tiny in the fourth, with art by Carlos Samper, who I don't know if I've uh, read anything that I can remember with his art on it, but I really liked this guy. Yeah, he does a great job here. Um, this was the best issue of Justice League in a while, I thought. Well, this is the one that kind of ties everything together, and it's like, okay, we're tying up all the loose ends. And when we're jumping forward. Exactly. This book refocused this whole run, which had definitely been starting to sort of meander around a little bit. Oh, yeah. And we are back snapped into laser focus. We know who's who. We know what's what. We know what the stakes are. The stakes are huge. Yeah, and everybody's here. Um, the plot of the book is that uh, the heroes are all going to repair the crack in the source wall. Because Starman's got a plan. Starman knows what's up. Um, they can use the three surviving Omega Titans from uh, New Justice. Yes. Uh, Turns out this is what they were made for. Right. And uh, they thought they weren't going to be able to plug the crack in the source wall because the Justice League killed one of them during uh, No Justice. Was that the Justice League? They or, shot its head off with like some giant cannon, right? Somebody <laughs> did. I don't. I mean, it was. They were all different Justice Leagues at the time. I don't remember which team. Oh, killed wasn't their that Green team. Arrow? And. Someone else. Amanda Waller? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amanda Waller was heavily involved. Yeah, bad move. <laughs> um, so, and uh, they can substitute, supposedly, a hawk girl for the fourth Titan, with the catch being that Kendra is going to actually have to go live in the source wall like one of those giant demigods. Right, and be conscious of it the whole time mostly. Right, and uh, they don't really get into details in the book, but it does kind of hint that this is going to interfere with her resurrection cycle. Like, if she's stuck on the source wall, she's not going to be able to die and resurrect. Right, no, that's like the end of her. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so, uh, they attempt to do this plan. All the Green Lantern Corps is there. They've been holding the wall together, and it's pretty cool to see the uh, the construct that the whole Corps was using to hold the crack shut and like realize, like, oh, that's all the Green Lanterns down there. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Maintaining a constant vigil. Like, just well, combined. Just willing the wall to stay. Literally. Yeah. And uh, the new gods are there, like Orion and... Uh, Light Ray and uh, High Father and Ganthet and it's just everybody shows up, but uh, unfortunately Brainiac has joined the Legion of Doom and he's got a plan to use Starman to uh, recorporealize yeah. uh, Perpetua. Right, Perpetua. Brainiac's back. Brainiac's back, and man, like he he was the shot in the arm the Legion of Doom needed. Man, oh yeah, uh, it's great having him with Luther again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, their, their their ego battle. So uh, they are successful, and we get to see Perpetua finally, the the mother of the monitors, apparently. Right. And uh, the source wall blows up. It blows up. It blows up. And the one of the consequences of this, the weirdest thing to me, is that apparently this means that all the new gods don't exist anymore. Because uh, oh, really? High Father and Light Ray and Orion just kind of like fade to nothing as the uh, Source yeah. Wall's energy. Because the all everyone on Apocalypse and New Genesis is tied into the Source Wall. That's where they get their power. Gotcha. And uh, we get this great page of uh, all these different areas that are tied into current books that are running and showing how they uh, are reacting to what happened. And we <laughs> see uh, Dark Side in his current terrible outfit. And he apparently is the only one of all of the new gods that uh, found a way, found a way to not get uh, blowed up when the source wall went to Bluey. Of course. And uh, the Spectre's mad, and mm -hmm. he's the most powerful thing in the DC universe. So you know that's a uh, that's a big deal. Yeah. No, he he <laughs> seems like he could mess uh, mess somebody up. Oh yeah. No, he will. 
the spirit of vengeance, baby. Yeah. Um, and then on the bottom panel, of course, is Grant Morrison's Operation Justice Incarnate from Multiversity. I always love it when they show up. Captain Carrot. Cool. For the win. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, Sourcewell's gone. Universe now has a ticking clock until its ultimate destruction. And I can't imagine what the Legion of Doom's goal might be in all this. No, well, they seem to be able to capture Perpetua. They captured Perpetua. She used so much energy blowing up the source wall and freeing her army that she appears to be in some sort of stasis now. Yeah, I bet they're going to try and siphon her power into themselves in some way. Yeah, but... And then be able to fix the... Like, what... You know, it's that classic <laughs> villain thing that, you know, you could accept right. in a Saturday mor- morning cartoon when somebody wanted to blow up the earth. But, like, <laughs> in, when you're doing comics at this level of storytelling, it's kind of more of a Luther. Mm-hmm. Like, I might be able to buy Brainiac wanting this, but what's your game plan here? Well, if, if they think that getting that power will allow them to uh, survive past the destruction of this universe and basically break free... From everything held within the source wall, they probably uh, are evil enough to think that this is, you know, enlightenment. They're going to be gods now. They're going to ascend to a higher source of being and become the new gods of a new creation. Yep. Same old story. <laughs> I, I'm still on board. Like, I had been heavily considering not continuing to get Justice League. <laughs> I know, they really saved it with this one. They pulled it back around. And the, honestly, the X Factor, I think, is tiny. And it's starting to become noticeable that any issue he co-writes with Scott Snyder is mm-hmm. noticeably more entertaining, more concise, and focused. yeah, more focused than any of them that Snyder's just doing on his own. That makes sense. So I would give the Justice League Annual a solid 8. All right, I'm going to give it a 7. Cool. Yeah, and it's a very good issue. All right, let's move on. Mm. All right, so moving on, uh, we have decided to uh, start picking up uh, Detective Comics. And man, dude, (laughs) we've been buying the wrong Batman. We've been getting the wrong Batman. It's uh, very clear (laughs) by this comic. comic. It's uh, Doug Tomasi and, uh, oh, I mean Peter J. Tomasi and Doug Monke. Yep. Love those guys together. Classic team. Yeah, they do a great job, and uh, so we have, uh, jumping in, we also read uh, last week's Detective Comics, right, but we're not, gonna read, we're, we're not going to read that, uh, review that here, just uh, 997, which starts out with uh, Batman and, uh, uh, what was his name? Thaddeus. Thaddeus. <clears throat> yeah. That is. <laughs> the man who trained Mr. Miracle of the New Gods in Escape Artistry. As well as Batman. As well as Batman, which I don't know if that's ever been previously set, but it's a pretty cool reveal if we're learning that right now. It is a pretty <laughs> cool reveal. Uh, so they're trapped in a shark tank. Right, that used to be Thaddeus' house. That used to be Thaddeus' house. And uh, yeah, they're, they're chained. Uh, can't do anything about it. But uh, we get some very excellent uh, escape artistry, man. Yeah, Batman. And the narration uh, is actually about the things that are happening in the comic. That's the word I'm looking for. We get some very good Batman narration right. on what's going on, what his options are, uh, what he's doing, and everything he's thinking about. Uh, also worrying about Thaddeus being an old man as he is, not being able to hold his breath as long anymore. Right. So the sharks come at him and... Very smartly, uh, Thaddeus, you, you know, he moves himself around in the water, wiggles a little bit so he can get uh, the leather strap that uh, mm-hmm. he's being tied down with uh, mm-hmm. into the shark's mouth so it can't bite, <laughs> and it gets stuck, and it dies. And then it becomes the target for the other sharks. It becomes the target for the other sharks, now, of and, all this... uh, you know, blood <laughs> shark running everywhere. Right, so... Th- then they release the piranhas, but just to double it, right? And then that's the one thing that I was kind of like, okay, when Batman is able to when successfully Batman take bites a little bit of shark, <laughs> uh, he catches it in his teeth and he drops it down onto the leather that uh, is tying his legs together. And then when the piranhas come over, they chew the leather enough that he's able to snap the <laughs> snap the leather. <laughs> Oh, and it's, it's so funny. It's great. It's great. That's but, some Batman like, 66 shit. Exactly. But it's so, it's written so seriously. Because, yeah, Batman would be taking this ridiculous situation super seriously. Exactly. So it, it's perfect right there. 
And thanks to all of that, they're able to escape the water, finally get some breath. <clears throat> and then from last issue, there was this, there's this monster. Right. It's this, this crazy thing. monster that keeps morphing between uh, all of Batman's villains, Batman himself, and, like and, it's a blob. <laughs> and by morphing between, we don't mean like he's changing from Joker to Two-Face. <clears throat> to, like, no. no, no, no. He's like a big monster, arms and legs, that has like... Four to six rotating heads phasing in and out of its muck, like the thing, and uh, turning into these various villains. And it also seems to weirdly like have little snippets of their personality because each head will talk have, like that. Yeah, it seems to be made out of their personalities. And then, but in this issue, this guy shows up and he's just like a big scary devil Batman. Yeah, he's built a big devil Batman this time. <laughs> But it's definitely the same monster that's been hunting uh, Batman and uh, people who trained Batman. Right, killing his former masters, which I know we weren't talking about the previous issue. But how crazy was it when Coyote Ken from Batman the Animated Series showed up? Oh, yeah, yeah that was awesome. <laughs> I yeah. do not believe that character has ever been in any of the comics before. He was oh, invented for the show. That's awesome. And Yeah, because, man, know. what a cool character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good moment. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, thankfully Batman is not too phased by uh, this monster, which is now not only becoming villain, uh, not only is it a big demon Batman, but little bits of like Robins and Alfreds are like popping out of its shoulders and like berating Batman yeah, for uh, everything he's done. I really, really want to know what this thing is. Right? Like, I mean, the end of this issue gives us a hint about who created it, and it's obviously a lab experiment gone wrong, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, Hugo Strange. Right, Hugo Strange. And that's where it ends, with the reveal that Batman has come to uh, beat, some, beat the crap out of Hugo Strange. Yeah, he figured it out. It's super strange. Although, unless there's another twist. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but man. Yeah, I doubt it. <clears throat> so this, I would give an 8. Yeah, I think it's the right score for this. It's good comics. Uh, I don't know how many issues we are into this arc, but I understood everything that was happening. It seems to be moving along pretty fast, too. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a solid piece of comic book writing, and I'm glad we're on Detective Comics now, yeah. especially during the countdown to Detective 1000. Nice. And, you know, it's true to its name. There is some good detectiving going on in these comics. Yeah, he's Batmaning in this, 100%. Yeah, it's exactly. not like a weird... Uh, mm -hmm. poetry prose piece about Batman physically overcoming somebody in like a dragged out fight which is what the main book likes to do this is having to escape a death trap yep. and having to <laughs> you know fight a psychological monster like physically though yeah. and then uh, do, yeah figuring out figuring out the case figuring out the clues yeah like mm -hmm. Tom King's run might be doing that but it's doing it over a hundred issues yeah exactly <laughs> I also like that it's not giving you Batman who's doing impossible things uh, like an ex machina and then given the only explanation of I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta fit, you gotta show the work. Right. You gotta show the work. <clears throat> Detective Comics. Alright, so uh, speaking of classic DC series, uh, we have the new issue of Action Comics, Action 1007, Part 1 of the Leviathan Rising arc. Bendis. And the yes, this is by Brian Michael Bendis. with art by Steve Epting, so it looks spectacular, all, if a little static. Um, the beginning is legitimately a lot of fun. Uh, Jimmy his, finds out his new girlfriend <laughs> Reptile. is uh, one of the uh, is a member of Cobra. Right. He and, keeps calling her a lizard. And, right, because she's a lizard person, and uh, <laughs> she takes him to a rally because she thinks he'll be into it for some reason, and he just goes full Jimmy and starts taking pictures, and Gets himself in trouble, and then the whole thing gets zapped away. Zap! Yeah, but he manages to escape. Of course. He's Jimmy Olsen, an action man. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then there's some Daily Planet stuff, and then there's this, like, six-page sequence where Lois is talking to her dad, General Sam Lane. And I do not understand what's happening with this arc. Yeah, it's a weird thing that happened right here. She tells <clears throat> her father... That she loves Superman, and that Superman is the father of her child. Right. She does not say Clark Kent is Superman, or no. I'm married to Superman. No, she doesn't. She totally makes it sound like she's been cheating on Clark 
with Superman forever. <laughs> forever, since before she got married. Yep. And I, I'd walk away from her, too. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> he walks away without a word, and what are you doing, Lois? Like, what's up with this? What, what is happening? Yeah. Do what? we know what his relationship is with uh, Clark? I don't know what <laughs> Sam Lane's relationship really is with Clark. I know he hates Superman. He's General Lane. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I, I could not tell you from anything that I've read, honestly. All right. So then, speaking of Amanda Waller, uh, she falls out of the building and yells Superman <laughs> and he comes and saves her, which she rightly says is pretty dope. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then that blue light that blew up the Cobra Rally also appears to engulf Amanda Waller's headquarters. Yep. And she gone. She gone. And that's Action 1007, Part 1 of Leviathan Rising. I... I somehow doubt that this is going to be Grant Morrison's Leviathan from Batman Incorporated. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> to everyone's detriment. <laughs> um, it looks pretty. Steve Efting's a good artist, but he's real static. He's good on like military stuff to me. Well, that makes like, sense. It, the Superman, little bit of Superman <laughs> flying around stuff is okay, but it's like compared to some of the other stuff we've gotten. It does like kind of look like a regular guy. Yeah, your Ivan Reese or your uh, Ryan Sooks or whoever mm-hmm. else we've been getting. So mm-hmm. I would give this eh, a three. Three? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, like think that's, part. I think that's right. Mm-hmm. It's three. It's a, it's a little bit confusing. Uh, the lowest stuff. And uh, like it didn't make it clear until late and that uh, all the Jimmy stuff was like, this This is catch-up. Because we already saw Jimmy and Clark have that conversation at Daily Planet after Jimmy wakes up the, the next day. I believe he already <laughs> uh, said, I kissed the losing person in a previous issue. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and Clark blew him off. I didn't <clears throat> catch that. I think you might be right. Yeah. I would have to go back to reread, which I'm not going to do. No, but it doesn't I make it clear. I think you might be right. It doesn't make it clear enough. So, yeah, I agree. Three. I think I kissed the lizard person. I think you're right. I feel that sounds so familiar. Right. A a tease from earlier. (laughs) Let's move on. And we are moving on to Star Trek The Q Conflict, issue one. That's right. By Scott Tipton, David Tipton, and pencil by David Messina. Yes. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, this Star Trek comics right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the art, I think, is uh, it leaves something to be desired. Uh, this is true usually with IDW's Trek titles. We're never getting, like, A-level mm-hmm. art on any of these titles. Yeah. And, it, uh, and it's always all, most obvious whenever they try to do, like, an action sequence, like people running down right. a hallway. People aren't emoting. Right, and uh, like if people are just standing around on the bridge giving orders, it looks right, like it looks like Star Trek, and the characters yeah. do look like who they're supposed to look like. Right, they do, but it's always mouths closed, uh, long speech bubbles. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little disappointed in, in that kind of thing. I mean, there, there's so much you can get from uh, throwing a few more panels of like somebody swinging their arm when they're saying something and... You know, some punches and kicks. Well, there's one action thing later when all the crews start to show up that I want to should mention when we get to it. But until we get there, mm-hmm. yeah. So, but I'm with you. Yeah, the one series from them that was best art wise was that Mirror series where it had yeah, that painted that, art style that was just so weird. Right, but it seemed yeah. really cool. Right. <clears throat> so this was hilarious though. <laughs> when uh, they the so things are going wrong in the galaxy and they can't figure them out. Right, right? they've been getting a lot of supernovas that are happening uh, billions of years before these suns should be going supernova. Right, and they've had like three, four in the last day. Uh, places are having to be uh, evacuated. It's not good, and they're they're all seeming to be in like. They're spread out throughout the galaxy. No, you figure out there's no pattern going out on in the beta quadrant, yep. uh, <clears throat> but there does not seem to be a pattern, and uh, <laughs> then it starts happening to uh, a, a sun that they're near, and then it just stops. So at that point, they're all like, "Okay, Q." Show yourself. Yeah, Picard literally is like, all right, open all hailing frequencies, all channels. Right. And Q, I know like this it. is you! And then the sun, 
that's near them stops going supernova. <laughs> so, what's going on? Picard and uh, Q, they talk it out for a minute. Turns out the Q Continuum is at war with a uh, few other races that are vying for superiority. All of which have previously shown up in Star Trek. All of which have previously shown up in Star Trek. Pretty cool idea. <clears throat> yeah, but Picard... He doesn't like that they're at war and it's spilling out over the galaxy. I mean, who would? And he says there's got to be a diplomatic solution, as he would. And so Q <laughs> decides... Q. <laughs> that sounds great. We'll have uh, the humans decide. We'll all choose some humans and have them fight it out. <laughs> <laughs> and the humans they choose, oh listener, let us tell you. Yes. So they choose uh, the cast of Voyager. <laughs> right. The cast of Deep Space Nine. Oh, yeah. The cast of the original series. Oh, of course. Trelane, and, it could have nobody else. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, Q chooses as his proxy Picard and his crew. Well, not Picard and his crew, because that is the twist at the end of the issue. And uh, is that um, they've each only chosen the captain... And then Q was like, all right, now let's start picking the rest of our teams. Who wants to go first? Oh, so it, that's right. why the covers are all like a mix. I think this is what we're going to get. One team that's Picard, Spock, Odo, Seven of Nine. Oof. And then God like... damn. But this is the other thing I want to show you. Man, Janeway, look at those boots, man, walking up. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Real big stompers. But uh, yeah, and then I think we're going to get a team that's uh, Kirk, Tuvok, Dax, Worf, which oh. that's a dope team. <laughs> that is a dope team. <laughs> so yeah, that's going to be, I think, part of the fun is that they're literally going to mix and match Ooh. all the crews and have them okay. interact with each other. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so we got we got Trelane as one of them. Uh, yep. We got the Metrons. Of course. Um, and when I was looking all these races up on Memory Alpha, they are all drawn to look like they looked when they appeared in the series. So Excellent. This, as so much of IDW Star Trek is, is just pure fan service. They just found like a hilarious angle that could never happen in one of the shows, actually. Yep. And they're just gonna they're gonna run with it. Yeah. Nah, I, I think this is a lot of fun, uh, with a little bit lacking somewhere, but it's a, it's a good kickoff issue. Yep. And uh, you know, I think I'll give it a six. I think six is right because the art. Does hold it back? Yeah, it does. Unfortunately, yeah. if it had, if it, if the art was a little better, you know, I'd give it a seven easy. If the <laughs> art was amazing, <laughs> well, we'll just have to read some more issues. All right. So moving on, uh, we picked up. I don't think this came out this week. I think this actually came out last week. But okay. uh, I was trying to fill out the ranks. So uh, we got the first issue of Marvel Comics Presents, which is an anthology series with uh, stories by some different creative teams about different characters. Um, the first one is a Wolverine story by Charles Sewell and Paolo Sequeira, which I thought was pretty good. Yeah, I, I felt like that was this is the best one. Yeah, this is the, the, three. the one that I maybe want to talk about this issue because yeah, it's just a real cool... Uh, like World War Two era Wolverine story yeah, where he fights a big so, scary demon. It's so sad. Yeah, it's it's basically a Hellboy story. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> like for all intents and purposes, and uh, yeah, it's Wolverine World fights War a demon. Two. Fight. He, he was thinking he was gonna fight some Nazis, but instead he fights a demon. And uh, the witch that some of the demons died uh, casting a spell that would force the demon away, but the demon could only be banished, not killed, and right. it will be back. Ten years later. <laughs> and the only one that will be able to stop it is her blood, her young daughter, and Wolverine's going to have to take care of that girl to be continued. Right. I mean, I imagine she'll die casting the spell as well. I can't imagine any other ending on a Wolverine story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh my god. Like, I... I, I yeah, yeah, no, it's just crazy. Yeah. So looking forward to that. Definitely going to get the next issue because uh, Charles Sewell writes a pretty good Wolverine, got to say. Yeah. All right, so the next one was a Namor story by Greg Pak and Tom Coker, which is a real bummer, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, it's basically about how the Allies tried to distract Namor 
while they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, because they knew he wouldn't be down with that. Yep. Um, which is 100% also the plot of the Masterman issue of Multiversity, oh. where they had to explain how they tricked Superman off the planet so they could do the Holocaust while he was gone. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, totally. Overman, I should say. And then, But then the uh, twist ending of the issue is that... Uh, Namor, he's all mad with the military. We get a little conversation with him, and I guess his military, you know, controller, the person he works with for the Americans. Yep. Uh, and uh, he finds out that they're going to drop the second bomb, and he uh, beats feet over there and gets in the way. Yeah. And it blows up in the atmosphere. And uh, yeah, that's it. I don't think this is to be continued. Um, oh. Because <laughs> it does uh, exp- it does show Namor in this like uh, image, kind of. Uh, predates his first appearance in Fantastic Four where he has amnesia and is living like a bum on the street. And then, like, Johnny burns away his bum beard and it's like, you're Namor! So I think that where this was a, this is what, how he lost his, uh, you know, mind. Bit, which I don't know if they've previously explained that or not. I'm right. not read a ton of Namor comics. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, it's a bummer. It's a bummer, but also pretty good. Not right. as good as Wolverine, but still pretty good. Right. Yeah, it's a good, a medium... And then we get the Captain America story by Anne Nesenti, penciled by Greg Land. And, man, penciled by Greg Land is rough. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Um, Greg Land is a notorious tracer. Everything is like a picture from a modeling book or something that he's traced over. And you can so read it and everyone's... Like, a lot of times he'll grab celebrity images off of the internet and be like, this celebrity is me as this guy. And he'll just use that guy for a retracing. That's why their faces are like that. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Greg Land, infamous for this. And the story is pretty boring because there's no real action. Yeah, and no real threat. Like, it's just Captain America teaches a lesson to a mom and daughter, kinda. Right. But he not doesn't. Really. He doesn't teach the daughter anything. He literally just teaches the mom to be cool. Right. Right. You think he's gonna <laughs> teach the daughter something, but then he's like, "Ah, oh, I see you've taken all the proper safety measures." And that's so such a weird thing for comic to do. Not like, a, "Oh, it's, you got to make sure you take the proper safety measures so that your mom won't be worried." It's like, "Oh, I see you, genius girl, have taken all the proper safety measures. Just we just got to show your mom that it's cool. Like, right. come watch this." mom it's funny because early in the issue when he first runs into her and she's on her bike i of course noticed uh, right away that she wasn't wearing a helmet right and i expected him to say something about it right <laughs> so true because he's captain america oh yeah i didn't even catch that part and you are 100 percent right yeah because she um, totally eats it and, like, even at the end, the way they put this, like, kind of bitchy face on the mom. It's like, yeah. ah, I'm still not happy about this. <laughs> like, ugh. ugh. Yeah, no, it, it, it was kind of pointless. But luckily, that one is also not to be continued. <laughs> All right. And next issue, we're going to get a continuation of the Wolverine story and then uh, Mr. Fantastic and a Gorilla Man story. So I'm probably... Got How could that not be good? Yeah. So, um, giving... The Wolverine story is seven, the Namor story a five, and the Captain America story a three. This averages out to a five for me. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I'd give Wolverine a seven. Uh, Namor, I would give a six. And Captain America, I'd give a two. So I think that also averages out to a five. That's like a four and a half. Yeah, think, four and a half, five. five. Um, but yeah, yeah, still uh, still pretty good. And yeah. the thing is, I like buying this kind of thing because I want to mm-hmm. support this style of comics for, especially Marvel and DC. Because, you know, I'd never probably buy, like, Namor number one or whatever. No. But, like, throw the Namor story in here. That's where you should be throwing the story. Like, Gorilla Man. Yeah, no one's going to buy that shit. But if you put the, what, it as one of the three stories in a Marvel Comics Presents, then, yeah. Yeah, no. Nah, Japanese style. Presents. You know? Shonen Jump. That's the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah okay so last for tonight we're going to be talking about the new age of heroes terrifics oh yeah meet the dreadfuls which great cover for one thing oh yeah they're dark reflections and we see their dark reflection as they're seeing them in a reflection yeah no yeah lots of fun it's like simultaneously that beatles cover but it's also <laughs> it's also kind <laughs> oh, of that invisibles so cover where they're all like, well, looking at the front. Right, yeah, with the half-shaded faces even. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, this comic is by Victor Bogdanovic. Bogdanovic. 
Uh, it's a hard to pronounce name. <laughs> and Jeff Lemire. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> like him. And yeah, for uh, Terrifics has generally been pretty good all the way through. And this issue holds true to that tradition. Yeah. Uh, starts where we left off uh, in, I believe it was uh, an annual or a, just a, a single issue, right? This yeah, is a, I don't a remember. New beginning. This is issue 12. Anyway, uh, Mr. Terrific, he's been hunting Dr. Dredd. Finally caught up to him. and But Dr. Dredd has assembled his... Team. The Dreadfuls. The Dreadfuls. <laughs> so on the Dreadfuls, you have Metal Morpho. Uh, yes! <laughs> from a world where uh, two scientists, uh, two mad scientists, maybe one of them's good, they're in an arm race uh, creating metal superheroes and metal supervillains and fighting them out. Yep, yep. Awesome. That's you got uh, yep. Phantom Boy, who is uh, uh, like a, he's a vamp. No, he's yeah. not the vampire. No, isn't, oh no, you're right. He's, he's a, a spectral teen from Earth-15. Uh, we'll, we'll see what he can do. That almost rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got a, a, a vampire plastic man no. named Plasma yeah. Man. Plasma Man. Yeah, yeah he, he's real dark. He's from Earth-43. The vampire Earth. The vampire Earth. <clears throat> and Dr. Dredd himself to be the uh, dark side of Mr. Terrific. He's he's made himself Mr. Terrific's enemy. Yes. The uh, evolved Neanderthal. Yep. And it turns out, Doc, Doc Dredd, the evolved Neanderthal, he led Mr. Terrific here to this specific Earth because on this specific Earth, uh, Holt... Mr. Terrific. His wife is alive, and she's Mrs. Terrific. Right. And Dr. Dredd wants to slowly kill her in front of Mr. Terrific. Yeah, he's real evil. He's really evil. <laughs> like, not just not not just an angry, uh, an, an angry proto-human. Right. But the, he's... No, he's definitely evil. Mm. We get a little bit of Phantom, Phantom Girl on her planet... Her mom's uh, arranging for her to be married, and she's not down with that. So yeah, what does she do? She goes and she uh, stows away at home. Because the suitor we see is like a like half job of the hut thing. He's sad though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Phantom girl refers to all the suitors as uh, gross slugs, and then we see this uh, this pink dude. I, I kind of like him. I think he's kind of cute. That's a Rick and Morty scene right there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, she's not down with that, so she stows away to go to Earth. She gets there uh, on Earth, and she's got nowhere to go, so she goes to Terrific Tower. Uh, Mr. Terrific, he ain't there because he's been chasing Doc, Doc Dredd, but uh, she manages to get his uh, uh, his distress signal. Right, on so, his panel. Yeah, so it's on. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Plastic Man, he's been trying to reconnect with his son. We get uh, a little bit of that, you know, his family, they're, they're not happy about the fact that he's been trapped as an egg in the dark multiverse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they won't even let him explain it. Nah, they, they don't want any of it. And it, it, it's sad. Poor guy. <laughs> I know, you feel so bad lovable. For, for old eel. Yeah, but he kind of warms, warms his way into his son's good graces uh, by stealing the Batmobile and taking it for a droid ride with him. <laughs> so that's fun. And it's a pretty cool Batmobile. Yep. Yeah, it is a cool Batmobile. Sort of a mix of the animated series with some like weird classic Batmobile elements. The the weird bat hood ornament thing that shows up on so many of them. Yeah, but and it's like real angular. It's got like the plow uh, yeah. in, in front of the tires, just the wedges. I like that a lot. It's a good one. And I, I, I mean, I understand why they don't show us, but you kind of want to get the page of how fast you can infiltrate the bat <laughs> and stole the Batmobile. Yeah, totally. But, you know, <laughs> you're not going to get it because he knows where it is. That's a good side story sometimes. <laughs> you know, he can just he can make his fingers into a key. Yeah. Whatever he needs. <laughs> Batman didn't plan for that. Yeah, really. You think Batman would use some, like, uh, digital locks as well as uh, manual. <laughs> but there you go. What can you do? Uh, and Rex, he's, Rex. Uh, of course, not metamorpho right now. <clears throat> And uh, he wants to be cool with that, but he's been a human for so long 
And he's got unfinished business. Which is that the thing that made him metamorpho is still there and could still make him metamorpho again. Right, the scepter. The scepter of Ra. Yeah, so he, he wants to break that. Uh, I don't think he actually gets the, the chance in this issue. No, because he then, cha- when the Phantom Girl hits the buttons and uh, summons the Terrifics and he right. realizes they need him. He and gets so the distress he, signal. He, it's the classic Ben Grimm storyline. Right, you know the world may not doesn't need Rex. The Rex, the world needs Metamorpho. The world needs Metamorpho. And, you know, honestly, he, he you, Oof. you can tell he wanted to do right. it. He was listless. He wasn't liking his life. He had lived the hero life. He couldn't yeah. be a regular guy anymore. Yeah. So what does he do? He smashes the scepter right there, and he becomes Metamorpho right there. And you know what? He had Element Dog with him. So Element Dog yeah. is. Once again, with us, with all those elements, awesome. Good stuff. Good place to end that issue. And, uh, yeah, I'd give it a 7. I'd give it an 8. I like it a lot. All right, nice. All right, that is it for this week's poll. So, thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. I hope you check out Sam and Max Hit the Books again.